Can we pray? Lord Jesus, I ask right now that you would just direct this message, Lord, the things that you want spoken, that you would, that they would be released. Lord, that you would open hearts right now to hear your word, to hear your truth, to hear what is happening right now in this season, in this time for us right now. So Father, we just say, have your way. Do what you want to do. We step into this river. We step into the deep river and we just say, carry us, take us where you want us to go. Would you stir our hearts in this time and would you reveal by your spirit those things that we need to hear specifically, individually for each one of us. Would you stir our hearts in those things and highlight those things that are for us right now in this time in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... I was contemplating where do we go from last week and, and the Lord just had me in this time of, of humility. We, there, is a, there is a foundational humility that we have to get. I was just talking to someone and it's like this is not the fun service where everybody goes, woohoo, we get to talk about humility. <laughs> Everyone wants to talk about like the, the good things of, of the Lord and what he's doing and the blessings of the Lord. This is one of those, though, that this is foundational for us. And if, if we don't get this into our foundation, if we don't get this into our root system here, uh, we're, we're going to miss out on a lot that the Lord wants to do. This is the way I, I saw it. Um, as, it is, as it is kind of this structural. So if you didn't know, I'm an engin- I'm, my background is engineering. I'm a civil engineer. And so you're going you're gonna to get to hear some of my engineering. Uh, I was with the staff on Tuesday, and, and I just said, I felt like the Lord is taking us from a 4,000 PSI concrete foundation to an 8,000 PSI concrete foundation. <laughs> and then I was like, so how many of you know what PSI means? Hey, look at this. You guys are much better than our staff. We had one person raise their hand. <laughs> I was like, okay. So if you don't know what PSI is, it's pounds per square inch. And so if you take an inch... And when the, the compressive strength of concrete for 4,000 PSI concrete uh, on a square inch, you can put 4,000 pounds on that. Um, but if you have 8,000 PSI concrete, you can actually double the weight that you can put on that concrete. And, and here's the thing that the Lord was showing me is there's, there's, there's a normal capacity concrete and then it's called high capacity concrete. And, and, uh, and it's, it can be used in, in uh, high rise buildings. And what it does is it, it lessens the weight of the overall building. It allows you to, to build higher, uh, and, and it's, it's cheaper, actually, um, and it's stronger. So there's, there's a building, actually, in, uh, um, in Chicago. Here it is, right here. And uh, I won't say the address, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's 961 feet tall. It's 65 floors. It was built in 19, it was completed in 1990, and it was constructed of 12,000 PSI concrete. So when you look at concrete out here, most concrete is about 4,000 PSI, maybe five. Uh, But this concrete, you could not, with 4,000 PSI concrete, you could not build this building. You couldn't go that high. You could go about a third the height. Uh, So you could get maybe 300 feet, but 960 feet, there's no way you could go that high with a reinforced concrete building. Uh, but, but here's what I was feeling, and, I, and I'm like, you guys, this is way too much, I know. My wife was like, don't get into the weeds on this. <laughs> You're going to lose everybody right away. <laughs> so I see people nodding off already. <laughs> like, all right, so here's my point. When we're talking about humility, there, so there, let, me, let me back up. To get from 4,000 PSI concrete to 8,000 or or 12,000, there are additives that you have to put in. There's admixtures or these agents that you have to actually put into the concrete that strengthen it to a greater capacity than it could have under normal conditions. And so what I felt like the Lord was saying is this humility that we're talking about, this is something that's actually, it has to be ingrained into our foundation. It has to be set. And it's not, you can't pour concrete and then after the fact go, oh wait, I want to restrain, I want to make it 8,000 PSI concrete. You actually have to put it into the concrete and mix it in. It has to be set in there before it's poured, before it begins to cure. It has to be in the concrete. And so this, this humility that we're talking about, when we say it's foundational humility, this is something that has to be set into the concrete before it's poured, before it, before it begins to cure. Okay? 
So it, 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 it is critical, I believe, to get us, if we don't have this in our mixture, if we don't have this humility in there, we're going to be stuck at 4,000 PSI concrete, and we can only go so high. And if we build any higher than that, things are going to start to crumble. Because humility is critical to where the Lord's taken us. It's, it's just critical in the Word of God. It's, it's critical to the life of Jesus. The opposite of humility is pride, and it's the most evil thing there is. It's, the, it's, the, it's kind of the crux of evil is pride. It's how, as we, I said last week, it's how Satan became Satan, was pride. So the other side of that, so pride, it lifts us up. Humility brings us low. And who had the most humility? Jesus actually walked in the, in the greatest amount of humility of anyone on this earth. And it's as we go low that he's the one. God's the one that actually begins to lift us up. It's, it's the grace that we have. We actually receive. It's, he opposes the, the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so we're going to go into that a little more. There is so much that I, I'm going to show you on this, on this understanding of giving grace to the humble. But... Um, the other piece I just wanted to share is there's a, we've been talking about there's a testing, right? There's a test, there's testings going on. I feel like there's a shaking going on right now. And, and trust me, this is the hand of the Lord in most cases. Maybe you've got a certain situation that you're like, no, that's not the hand of the Lord. But let me say overall, I believe that what's happening right now is there's a shaking going on. And what it is, uh, we've talked about it, it's kind of like, um, Christy was explaining it like a pecan tree and you, you, you hit it with a hammer and, and the fruit begins to drop and it actually drops early. And what it is is you get, to, you get to analyze the fruit. You get to see the fruit and go, oh, what fruit is being produced right now? In the same way with concrete, as it's curing, you take these what are called concrete cores. You take these cores and, and, and they're like two-inch cores and then you take them out and you break them. And you, you put stress on them, and, you, and what it is, it's a testing of the concrete. And, and I feel like this is sometimes that testing of our heart, uh, that there are these cores being taken out, and, and the Lord is actually testing it. The good thing is, is he's not testing the foundation. It's not like, well, let's build on it and see if this thing actually holds, right? If, <laughs> this is, you wouldn't do this in the construction industry, because if you just start building on it, and you put your building up, and then you're like, oh, I guess that concrete wasn't as strong as we thought. <laughs> so you test the core samples, and, and that's what tells you the strength of your concrete. And I believe that there is a testing right now of our hearts. And I want, I want you to hear this kind of now with this analogy, with this understanding, is if you go to James 1, 2 through 4, and I think we have it. So here's this testing that's happening in our hearts right now. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face the trials of many kinds because you know that the testing, here's that, those core samples, the testing of your faith, and so I put it in here, so that's that concrete core samples. This is what develops the perseverance. This is that strength that happens through the curing pot process. Uh, concrete typically takes about 28 days to cure. So from day one to day 28, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And so you test during those, those curing times to make sure that it's actually gaining the strength that it's supposed to gain. And you can check at day seven, and you'll have a very good feel for what it's going to be at day 28 um, based on understanding the, the, just the complexities of, of how concrete cures. But I'm not going to get into that. So, uh, so it, it develops perseverance, and then it says, and perseverance which is that curing, it must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. High strength concrete. So that we can have that maturity and that, that, that completeness not lacking anything. So I believe this is what the Lord is doing right now is he's actually setting this humility in the mixture right now to increase the strength that we would have a high capacity, a high strength concrete, okay? There's your lesson in engineering. <laughs> now you can talk about all the, anyway. <laughs> uh, let me just say this as well, just being relevant to what is going on in today's world. You guys heard of this thing called the coronavirus and, um, and then even out of that, what's happening like in the stock market and things. And uh, 
what's crazy is how this is driving fear into people's hearts right now. Um, and this is what the world does. When we put our hope in the things of this world and, and it doesn't turn out like we thought it was supposed to, fear comes in, right? But when, we're, when our hearts are set on the Lord, when our hope is in, in Him and in His ways, then these things actually have no impact on us. They, they don't deter us and they, and they don't create fear in our life. They're not... If there's fear right now, if you're, look, if you're watching, for one thing, stop watching the news all the time. <laughs> all the news does is bring fear. <laughs> so I get it. Don't put your head in the sand. We do need to know what's going on in the world around us, but not to the point where we just saturate ourselves in it. Uh, we're not of the world. We're in the world. Big difference. We're, this is what I'll say. Jesus was in the world. He was not of the world. He was the thermostat. And, and not the thermometer. And we are never meant to be thermometers. We're never meant to reflect the temperature of what's going on around us. We're meant to set the temperature. We're temperature setters, okay? So when fear comes in, remember that you're not a reflector of what's going on of the temperature around you. What you begin to do is you begin to set the temperature. It's that Isaiah 60 where it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. You see there's, there's darkness over the world, there's thick darkness over the people, yet the glory of the Lord actually rises upon us. There's, there's a light that actually, it says the uh, nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. This is the time and this is the season where, where we are actually a light and, and the darker things get, the brighter we shine. So remember that we aren't called, we're not here to just kind of go along with the things of this world. And when there's this coronavirus and things going on that we don't go, ah, but that we go, oh, yes. These are good things because, not good things, but, but, but it's good in the sense that when there's hopelessness, guess what? Who brings hope? Who brings light? So remember what you're here for. And the darker things get, man, the brighter we get to shine, the more we just get to engage in people's. It's when things get bad that we actually have a greater opportunity to have an impact on people's lives. Okay? Got it? Let me say this too. I, I, was, with this, I was with our area pastors. I get to pray with them every Thursday. Uh, about 20 of them uh, come every Thursday. And uh, so we're praying together. And one of the pastors, uh, just we started praying for the, uh, um, regarding the coronavirus. And, <laughs> and it's good. I'm glad we're praying for it. But I just felt this shift. And we made this shift. And I just began to pray. I said, you know, the coronavirus is one thing. And, and we go, well, there's no cure. We need, we're praying for the cure for the coronavirus. Like, this is killing people. There's lives at stake here. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> That's great, and, and I get it, and I don't want to make too, much, too light of it, but there is something that we need to understand. We're focused on this coronavirus, and there's a virus out there that's killing people that, that, that they don't actually have eternal life, and each one of us do have the cure. We have the cure right in front of us. We have this, and yet we have neighbors that have this virus that are going to die, and we have a cure, and I guarantee if we had the coronavirus cure, We'd be like on the news telling everybody about it, right? Let me tell you that we have a greater cure than the coronavirus fear. Because if, if we die of the coronavirus, so what? Who cares? Like death has no sting on us. But those that don't know Jesus, death has a sting. Sin is the sting of death. And so we have the opportunity to actually bring the cure. So uh, this is that, that shift in mindset that we need to have, okay? So when we see this coronavirus, use it as an opportunity to share the gospel with someone. You say, look, you may not have the cure for that, but I've got a greater cure that you, can, that you need that, that then makes that coronavirus like it doesn't even matter anymore. Okay, so now let me actually get into the message here. <laughs> All right. If you go with me to Colossians 3, and I'm going to read just 12 and 14, verses 12 and verse 14. So, um, and I want to show you something really cool that I, we just, we were going through as a, um, in sermon prep on Thursday, and I was like, oh, 
to, I just began, we began to see this together and like, okay, this is the way this actually works here. So Colossians 3.12 says, and I'm going to read it out of the NIV. Uh, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly love, clothe yourselves with compassion. Clothe yourselves with kindness. Clothe yourselves with humility and with gentleness and with patience. And over all, so here it talks about, it goes into forgiveness, which <laughs> I'm taking it out, but it is an important part that we actually walk in forgiveness. <laughs> but jumping to verse 14, so over all of these virtues here, put on unselfish love. And that's that, that's that agape love. So we put on this agape love. And then it says this, which binds them together in perfect unity. Here's the thing I was seeing. And then this is what the, if you go to the, uh, the Amplified, the last part here says, for everything is bound together in agreement when each one seeks the best of others. That is this place of humility that we're called to walk in. And when we do this, when we step into that, there is a binding that happens for the body of Christ. And so what I was seeing is, is the humility is actually, it's kind of like the glue to the family, to the kingdom family. So it's that thing that actually glues us together is this humility or this unselfish love that we have for each other where we actually clothe ourselves and put others first with kindness and, and that compassion and that humility. We are called not to, we don't love ourselves first. And this is the, there's so many false teachings out there about this. Um, we're actually called to die to ourselves, and, and it, this is what Jesus did. He didn't go, well, I'm going to love myself first. He was loved. And we under, there's a difference between loving yourself and receiving the love of the Father. Receiving the love of the Father, absolutely. Loving yourself becomes a selfishness and actually is a pride that rises up. There is a big difference. And so when you understand who you are in Christ, that's the identity that you need to have. It's not about loving yourself. It's about receiving and knowing the Father's love. Then out of that, we can go low. We can, be, we can get down and we can serve others because we know who we are in Christ. And now we begin to love out of a place of humility and we're serving. We're, we're doing exactly what Jesus did when he puts that, when he takes off the outer garment and he wraps it around and he kneels down and he grabs the basin and he washes the disciples' feet. That's the humility that we're called to. That's the servanthood that we're called to as the body of Christ. We need to be washing people's feet all the time. You can start with mine right here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> like, ha ha. <laughs> we do need to wash each other's feet. Maybe not literally. I know we all have some, some people have really stinky feet. Uh, but the point is, is that we actually serve each other well that we actually walk in that place of humility. So out of that, this is what I want you to see with this. If you can put up, there's a, a pyramid. So humility, it's, it's, he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, right? So that humility is kind of that foundational element that we see there. Uh, there's, this is not like the only graph here. So like, I mean, obviously you're like, well, where's love? Love is foundational. So don't, uh, just, but just um, what I'm focusing on is this understanding of humility and how this, in this foundation, what it actually does for us. So once we have humility, when we walk in humility, there is a grace released in our lives. Uh, I'll say a lot of times it requires a place of repentance. Uh, my, my dad, uh, who never messed up in his life, no. He's not here, but he would tell you he, he messes up all the time. And, uh, but what I've seen in his life is, man, there's such a grace on his life. And it's not because he walks a perfect life, far from it. But what he does is he walks in a humility that I've seen where when he messes up, man, he is like, he immediately goes and he just repents. He repents before the Lord and repents before others. And then he goes and messes up again. But then he goes and repents. And, and what I say, I'm like, how do you have so much grace? And I, I just, it's because of that repentant heart. It's because of that place of, of going low, of humility. And in that, he gives grace to the humble. So there's, whoops, there we go. So there's that grace. And then let me show you this. So out of that grace, 
that's actually where we get our giftings. So there are giftings that, that through the Holy Spirit that we actually have that come from, they all come, not that come from grace, everything, every gifting that you have comes from the Holy Spirit. And it actually comes from grace, which actually comes from humility. So if you're like, man, I just don't feel like I'm very gifted, get humble. <laughs> Get humble before the Lord and allow the grace of God to come into your life, which will bring giftings into your life, and you will be used in a mighty way. But until you get humble, man, he opposes the proud. He doesn't give grace to the proud. He gives grace to the humble. So, so this, I, I, wanna, I hope we catch this here. There's just some key pieces I want us to catch. Um, so from grace to giftings, if you go to Romans uh, oops, yeah, 12, and it's actually verses 5 and 6. Uh, it says, so in Christ, we who are many form one body. So understanding, and there's a lot I could go into here, which I'm not, I don't have time to today, but understanding that we're the body of Christ, we each play our part, but it goes on to say, we have different giftings, and it's according to the grace that's given us. So there's that humility which then releases grace, and then the grace, it's according to the grace given us that it's now we have these gifts that are given to us by the Holy Spirit. The other verse there is, is uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. It says, and these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he gives, he gives them, he gives these gifts to each one just as he determines. How does he determine? He determines from the place of humility that we walk in. So if you're like, man, I'm just... This guy's much more gifted than I am. There's many more gifts that he's walking in. I would just say, you're, don't strive for the gifts. Strive to go low. Strive to get humble before the Lord and let him be the one that lifts you up. He will lift you up. And, and let me say, have patience too because it says, it says in 1 Peter 5, 6, it says, in due time. Sometimes we go, okay, Lord, I went low. Where's my giftings? <laughs> and he's like, dude, have patience. Allow him to do what he's doing in your life and, and, and work through you the way he wants to work through you. It's not about you. It's all about him. Okay, so the next piece of it is in those giftings, this is the other piece. Is a lot of times we go, man, I am so gifted in these areas and I'm not being utilized. I see this in the body of Christ sometimes. And then what happens is there's like a, a pain that comes in, like, man, the body isn't utilizing my giftings. And, and it's more of an inward focus of, I've got these great things that I want to do. It's not, again, I just go back to, it is not about us. It's all about him. It's going as low as we possibly can go. There's a scripture in Romans 12 uh, that's, uh, it's in the Passion. I'm going to mess it up. Um, can you throw me by Bible? It's in there, the, the Passion version. I just, I, I love this verse, so I'm going to, thank you. This has become one of my favorite verses here. Uh, Uh-oh. Here it is, yeah. 1210. So it says, be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers as members of one family. And then it says, try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor to one another. This is, I feel like, if we can get this, this is the one area where you can outdo your neighbor, where you can go, man, I'm better than you. <laughs> I'm better than you in loving you, honoring, and respecting you. Uh, that's where we're going to outdo each other. When we start to outdo each other there, man, it's going to shift the body of Christ. We're going to become so united. We're going to become so strong as a body, as, as the Lord actually desires to have his body, his kids working together as one, is when we actually outdo ourselves with honor and respect. So, so the giftings, we need to realize that these giftings are for others and not just for ourselves. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 12, 7, in the New King James, it says this, but the manifestation of the Spirit, which is the giftings, when, when, the, when the manifestation of the Spirit happens, it's the, those are the giftings, it's given to each one, what? 
for the profit of all. Guys, let's say it together. For the profit of all. So the giftings that you have, are they for you? They're for the profit of all. And, and so in this, if you go back to that uh, diagram, that this is what brings us into a place of unity and then glory is released. And I want you to catch this last part. In John 17, 22, uh, it says this. So this is Jesus' prayer to the Father. He's praying about unity. And in this verse, I, I, have, I hadn't seen this before this way, but it says, Jesus says, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. There is a connection there with there is glory that actually we have upon us. Why? For that unity. And on the other side of it, when we walk in unity, when we come into that unity, there's actually a glory released to the, for the Father. So there is, this is kind of the pinnacle of it here is, and you could go either, you could put the unity at the top of the, well, but then the glory actually goes back to the Father. So it's actually, there's a glory and then a unity and then a glory released to the Father. But he puts his glory in us. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. There is a glory that he actually puts upon us. He gives to us that we would be one as he is one with the Father. So as they are one, we're supposed to have that same oneness. You realize like that's a different type of oneness than what we currently actually operate in when it's that same oneness that Christ has with the Father. That's, that's where the glory comes in and actually unites us as one. Okay, you got that? Okay. Um, All right, Lord. Let me just, I want to take you to the, I was going through this with Christy last night, and, and she said it really well. In, in the Beatitudes, at some point we are, we're going to just preach through the Beatitudes. They're so good. But what I want you to see, I just want to quickly walk through them today, and you guys can just, you can dive into them on your own time. Um, but I, I love the fact that these are actually weapons against pride. Uh, and, and you would say, like, we look at weapons as, as, you know, I don't know. When you look at this, this is not the type of things you would call weapons. But these are actually the weapons that we fight with against pride. So you can go to, to Matthew 5. I'm going to, I think I have a slide. Did I give you a slide? Thank you. She's on it. Um, so this is uh, Matthew 5. Look, just look at these here. So blessed are. And, and, and I, then I took, just took out the blessed are, but the poor in spirit. So this is the first one. And, and understand, I think a lot of times we don't really understand what poor in spirit is, but it's devoid of spiritual arrogance. It's, it's that that's the poor in spirit. In Isaiah 66, it says, the one that I esteem is humble, contrite in spirit, or poor in spirit, and trembles at the word of the Lord. That's the one that the Lord esteems. And same thing here. You see this, these connections from the Old to the New Testament. This is Jesus going, the poor in spirit, those who regard themselves as insignificant, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the second one, it's for those who mourn. And again, I think there's a confusion there of what does that mean? Like, is it just to be sad? Well, no, it's over sins. It's that place of repentance. It's what we were just talking about is, is there's a constant place of repentance that has to be in our hearts. If we, aren't, if we aren't in a place of repentance, if we think that sin is not in our life, <laughs> beware. What, is, what does the Lord say about that? Uh, he says, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands. That's not, that's not the verse I was looking for. Um, oh, here it is, right here. Verse 1 8 says, If we claim to be without sin, this is in 1 John, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So, this, this next one here, it's this understanding, that morning is that we are in a place of repentance, that when, when the Lord reveals things in our heart, and there is a constant revealing, this is that testing that goes on that we go, oh, yeah, that's not right. Lord, would you remove that? 
And, and all we do, that, that repentance is actually turning from those things. It's turning away from those things. It's not like saying I'm sorry and then doing it again and again and again and again. It's actually turning from those things. So it, it goes on to say, if you, if you claim to be without sin, you deceive yourselves and the truth isn't in you. But if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That seems to be a better way to go, right? So... <laughs> So that's that those who mourn, they will be comforted. It's that the burden of sin will be lifted from them. When you walk into that place of repentance, the third one is being when for the meek and the humble and the gentle, the kind-hearted, the, that sweet-spirited and self-controlled, they're the ones that will inherit the earth. So it's that place again. These are the weapons to, that come against that area of, of pride in our life. When we operate in these ways, and this is what Jesus is saying. Step into these things. Walk in these ways, and, and you'll, you'll inherit the earth. You'll, you'll, yours is the kingdom uh, of heaven. Like, these are the amazing things that we have when we do this. The next one is those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You'll be filled. You'll be satisfied. If you can go to the next slide, there's a few more there that I'll just go through quickly. Um, the merciful. When you're merciful, guess what? You receive mercy. There's a number of places where Jesus talks about this. Uh, we are to be merciful. I won't get into that one. The pure in heart. It's the pure in heart that see God. The next one is the makers and the maintainers of peace. When we, when we walk in peace, and, I, and I'll tell you here, there's two types of peace. There's like, we think, well, the peace of this world. I just need to keep peace in this world. There's actually a peace that's required right here. This is the peace that we're talking about here, peace with God. And what we do is we are makers of peace. How are we makers of peace? We're ambassadors of Christ. And we actually bring peace between God and others as ambassadors of Christ, as ministers of reconciliation. And that's the peace that he actually calls us to. Uh, and we will be called sons of God. The next one is those who, pers who are persecuted for doing uh, that which is morally right. And, and morally is... Uh, yeah, anyway, that which is right, that which is holy. That's, I think that's a better way to say that. Morally right is that which is holy. Um, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then the last one is blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of, of evil against things against you because of your association with the Lord, with Jesus. So these are the things that actually help us to walk in that place of humility. And, and something that's really cool is in the Old Testament, the, the word for blessed is barak um, in the Hebrew. And it actually, if you get down to the root of it, that word means to kneel. It's a place of humility. So it's just got a kind of a cool connection there. So I want to, what I want to do, this is the other part I just want to hit on, is, is as we talk about humility, and we receive the grace of God, there are, there are giftings that, we're, that, that we receive. But I want, you to, I want to make sure we understand something, that there is a difference between giftings and talents. Talents are things that, that you can do on your own. God's given you these things, but, but you're created with these things, and man, you're good at them. Like, there are things we could all say we're good at, Right? For me, I know, I mean, I was in the business world for a number of years, and I was like, I'm good at business. My dad would always say, hey, if you ever want to be in ministry, you know, let me know. I would, you know, I'd love to, for you to be in ministry. My dad, you know, he was a pastor for, gosh, 37 years. And, um, and I was like, Dad, I am called to the business world. I, I am not called to be in ministry. And uh, why? Because, because, and I would say, because I'm good at business. And so I know I'm called to business. There was a misunderstanding that I had, and, and, and I want to show you this. Our talents are great, and we use our talents for the Lord. There's a scripture uh, in, in uh, Colossians 3.23 that says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. That's our own talents. That's the things that we do. Uh, we, we work at it with all our heart as working for the Lord and not for men. So when you're using your talents, men, use them for the Lord. Use what you've been given in that sense for the Lord. But here's the thing. Giftings come from grace. The word grace, the Greek word, is actually charis. The word gifting is charismata. So the, the root word of, or of giftings is grace. And so 
it's in that that the, out of grace comes giftings. Uh, and it's kind of cool that that's the Greek. That's how it actually works. Uh, but so it's in grace that we have giftings. It has absolutely nothing to do with your talents. Do they sometimes go hand in hand? Yes. But often they don't. And, and, and this is what happens. This is what trips us up is a lot of times we go, well, I'm just not good at that. And so I'm not supposed to do that. Even though there's a stirring in your heart and you know you're called into something, you're going, well, that's, <clears throat> that is just not me. When Moses, you got to see this, when Moses was, uh, um, when the Lord was talking to Moses, he's like, look, I want you to take the Israelites, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to bring them out of Egypt. And, and Moses is like, are you kidding me? Like, I can't talk. Like, I stutter when I talk. I don't know how to lead. I don't know how to do this. He gave four excuses to the Lord. The first one, I just, I'll just quickly go through it. He goes, he says this to the Lord. He goes, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God says, I'll be with you. That's the grace that was on his life that, to give him the giftings to actually carry him through to do the things that he was called to do. When we see Moses in the Bible, when we see, you know, in, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, when we see this, that's not Moses' talent. That's actually the giftings of the Lord in his life to operate in a way that he was able to carry out the task that he was given in that time. It's funny, the last one, we were laughing about this because after he gives every excuse he can possibly give, he goes back to the Lord and he just goes, oh Lord, please some, send someone else to do this. <laughs> like that's his final response to the Lord. Like, okay, I don't know, like you've, you've answered all my questions, but would you just please send someone else? <laughs> and uh, the Lord was like, no, 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 I'm calling you to do it and you're going to do it. And, uh, and he finally stepped into it and and man, um, yeah, anyway, you know the rest of the story. Another one is Gideon. Gideon, here's, here's a man, and this is, in Judges 6, it says this, the Lord turned to Gideon and said, go in, you, in the strength that you have. That right there, I would call that your talents. So he's like, go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And then Gideon says, but Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. So here's, here's Gideon coming back and saying, no, you got to see my talents. Like, I, I, I don't, I'm not set up for this. <laughs> this is, if you look at my resume, like, it's not in there. I, I don't have, like, take out the Midian army. <laughs> and, and, and the Lord's like, no, 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 you don't understand. This is not your talent. You do what you're supposed to. You just step out and do it. I'll come alongside you and we'll do this together. And the Lord answers. He says, I'll be with you and we'll strike down the, Midian, the Midianites together. We'll do this together. And, and that's the gifting coming upon him. And he does it eventually. If you know the rest of the story, like, I mean, it's like one fleece after another, right? <laughs> But finally, he enters into it and he does it. And uh, the Lord has a lot of grace and patience in that. For me, when I was in, in Houston, um, back in, in, this was up to 2014, I was doing development. I was uh, the vice president of a company there. And, and it was great. And this was like, these were, I was utilizing my talents. I don't know if I was utilizing for the Lord. I love the Lord. Um, but, but I knew there was a calling on my life, yet I struggled for four months. Why? Because I can tell you that it is not my talent to lead a church and to preach on Sunday morning. It's just not. It is, there's nothing in me that goes, woohoo! <laughs> like, this is going to be great. <laughs> I was always, I remember growing up going, Dad, I could never preach on Sunday mornings. Like, I, I remember in high school taking a, a, uh, a public speaking class. And I mean, <laughs> I used to try to think like, how can I be sick today? Like, like every time I had to do public speaking, I would get up and I mean, I'd try to, you know, have it all in my head, have it all worked out. And I'd get up and literally it was like, Ugh! my brain would just freeze. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to, you know, you get up to public speak and, and it's like, 
ah, everything freezes and all of a sudden it's like your body clicks on the sweat glands and you can just like, <laughs> and you just start sweating like crazy, right? I heard, I heard this. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of studies out there. This was actually somebody that is a stand-up comedian and he was saying, he goes, you know, uh, they've done these studies and they find that the number one fear is public speaking and the number two is, is death. Uh, so, so he's like, so here's the deal. It would be like if you were at a funeral, you would actually rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. <laughs> that was me. I would have much rather been in the casket than giving the eulogy. I hated to speak. But here's the thing. It's not about me. It's about what the Lord wants to do. And so it is very often that the Lord calls us into things that we're not actually good at. Why? Because it keeps us out of that place of pride. When Paul, Paul talks about the thorn in his side, there's a messenger from Satan that actually came and put a thorn in his side. Why? Because of, he says, because of the great revelations that he had, that he wouldn't come into a place of pride. And, and the Lord actually didn't remove that messenger of Satan. He said, no, my grace is actually sufficient for you. What does that mean? Here's the grace which brings you into the giftings. You see that connection there? It's not about your talents. And he's like, man, I, I need to get rid of this thorn in my side so I can actually do the things that I'm supposed to do. And he's like, no, it's actually all about my grace that brings you into these things. It's the grace that gives you the giftings, that brings you into the unity, that releases the glory. When we operate in our talents, the scary thing is, is often it raises pride in our own life because we go, look what I can do. Not always. There are, there are things, I, I, I mean, where we're, where we're doing, we're using our talents for the kingdom. But boy, I'll tell you, it is very often that we actually, and I did it. I, I did it with business. I thought, man, I'm good at this. I can do this. The Lord, the, the definition of humility is complete dependence upon the Lord. When we were created, we were not created just to utilize our talents. We were created to have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And with the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, that's that grace that actually gives us the giftings that we're called to do. We're called to live beyond our own abilities. We're created to live beyond our own abilities. I, I just, I want us to get this because I think this is how the body of Christ becomes the body of Christ. This is, and when we're utilizing things, when we're doing things beyond our own abilities, and it's not for us, we're not doing these things for us, we're doing them for the kingdom, we're doing them for others, we're doing them for others around us when, like, I'm going, Kevin, how do I serve you? How do I come alongside you? How do I use the giftings that, that, that the Holy Spirit has put on the inside of me to actually lift you up and raise you up and bring you into the things that you're called to do. And then Kevin does that to somebody else. Kevin comes over here and does that to Tracy. And, and, and man, he's just ministering to Tracy. And, ministry, and Tracy's ministering to Anna. And all of a sudden, man, we become the body of Christ and are raising each other up and strengthening each other. <laughs> Zechariah 4, 6, and 7. Such a cool verse. I love this. You could put this thing up in your room and remember this. God says, it's not by power, it's not by might. Those are both talents. It's not by your own power, it's not by your own might. And don't confuse that with the Spirit's power, because it is by the Spirit's power, and it is by the Spirit's might. But it's not by your own power, it's not by your own might, it's by my Spirit, says the Lord. That's that live, move, and have our being, which I was talking about in Acts 17. This is what we're actually called to. When we live in this, when we go into the deep, it's Ezekiel, if you were here for the conference, Paul Yadao, he talked about uh, knowing your east. And let me just explain this. It's really cool when you understand this. Uh, it's Ezekiel 47, it's the waters actually come out to the east. The waters pour out from the temple to the east. And it gets ankle deep, then knee deep, then waist deep, and then it goes beyond the depth that we can actually stand that no man can cross. And, and that, that east, knowing your east, is what this is, is it's actually knowing which way the river is flowing. And when we step into the river, what we're doing is we're actually stepping into the things of the Spirit. 
We're actually stepping into the giftings that we're called to by his. As we humble ourselves, we have the grace of the Lord upon our lives, and we step into the giftings. That's our east. It's, it's going into the deep waters that go beyond anything that we could actually do on our own ability. How many of us right now, I don't want to say it. Don't, don't raise your hand, but, but just think for a second. How many of us are actually living beyond our own ability right now and utilizing the gifts of the Spirit over our talents? And I would just encourage us, this is not how we're supposed to live. There are greater things for each one of us. It starts with humility. If we don't have that place of humility, man, our, we're, going to be in the, we're going to be in the shallow waters. <laughs> But man, as we go, as we get humble before the Lord, as, we, as we, our dependence goes completely on him, the giftings will increase. His grace will increase. And we, what we begin to do is we begin to step into waters that we can't stand in. We begin to flow in those waters and the, and the Holy Spirit begins to move in our lives. And we get to do things that we can't do on our own ability. Gideon lived a life outside of his own ability. Moses lived a life outside of his own ability. David, King David, when he goes before the giant and he's running at the giant with a sling uh, to kill the giant and he goes, I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty. He's running in his own ability, but I guarantee you it was not his own ability that slayed the giant. As he, as he ran with what he had, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he slayed the giant. We're called to slay giants but we cannot do it on our own ability. We do it by knowing our ace, by stepping into the things that we're called to. And as we go beyond into the deep, and it's risky, it's scary, because guess what? You can't do it on your own. Man, coming back here and laying down and giving up my job, which I was like, that's my talent, laying that down to come back and do this, this is not my talent. <laughs> if, if you heard sermon prep, you would realize this is not my talent. <laughs> I want, wow, this is going to be horrible. <laughs> but there is something when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon us, there's like, it's him that begins to operate through us. It's so much greater and so much, it's so freeing because it's not about us anymore. It's not about, oh, I got to do the things that I, like, that I can do in my own ability and strive. No, it's about flowing with the Spirit. Come on, come on. <laughs> All right, I got three minutes because <laughs> I know you guys are hungry and you'll probably get this whiff, <laughs> the smell of the food coming now. Um, I'm going to wrap up. But there's, a, there's one other thing I just want us to, to hit here. Um, the other side of the pendulum here is when, let me just, let me just see how I say this here. Um, I see this often as well in the church, is sometimes what we do, there's two sides of it. One, one I see is, is we'll sometimes re we'll, we'll step back when we're called into something because we go, oh, that person can do it better than I can. And, and we'll be like, no, I'm just going to step back and, and let them do it. When there's a calling in your life, when there's an assignment on your life, you need to step into the things that God's calling you to do. And, and don't, don't, give that, don't give that up because you go, well, they're more talented than I am. It is not about talent. It's about the grace of God in your life. And, and from the other side of that, I want to say that, that sometimes I see this. I see people where, where in, and this is inside and outside the church, uh, wherever it is. But I, I see it, especially in the church, where people are like, man, I can do that better than they can. I'm, I'm better at that than they are. And they'll strive to like, in a sense, take over a position. You'll see church splits because of it. Uh, you'll see just horrible things happen in the church. It's not about our talents and it's not about doing things to, to give us glory. It's about doing things to him, give him glory. And so when, when we say, well, I could do that better, but I'm gonna serve, what you're doing is you're gonna go low and he'll lift you up in due time in his due time, not in your time. I'll tell you a quick story. When I was, uh, I, I think it was, I was in college, um, and I, I was playing volleyball. I was playing, it's like two-man sand volleyball, and I was playing, I w went to University of Colorado. I didn't play on the, on, the, on the 
team. I wasn't that tall. I needed another like three inches of height. But, but I would play. We'd play for hours. And, uh, um, and so I got pretty good. I was a I, was, I mean, I could do jump serves and, and, um, and spike it, no problem. And, um, and, uh, and my sister, she was a very good volleyball player as well. And so um, our family, my dad and Yvonne, we were like, okay, we're going to go. We had an opportunity to go up to Denver at the Denver Coliseum. It was, I think it was United States versus Russia or something in volleyball. And so we got tickets and we went up to this event and, uh, you know, it was really cool. At halftime, they, they had this, uh, this give or this drawing an opportunity to win a car. And, uh, and there were three people that were drawn, and my dad was one of them. And so there was like, you know, 30, 35,000 people there in the stands. And, uh, and so, you know, they brought a lot of the people down. So we're down on the floor, and we got to go down with my dad. And, um, and I'm watching these other people, and what they had to do is they had to hit a volleyball. They had a, the car that they brought in that you could win. They had the window rolled down, and you had to actually hit the volleyball through the window of the car. And so I'm watching these people and I'm like, oh, these people are idiots. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to do this. Like, you know, and, and so, the, the, you know, it's kind of parted. Like there's people on both sides and the car's at the other end and the first person hit it and it's like, it kind of goes off. It doesn't even make it to it. I'm like, oh man, like they just missed it. Second person did it and then my dad was up and I'm like, I knew how to do this. I'm like, dad, you got to hit it overhand. Like, throw it up and hit it hard. And that's the only way it's going to work. You've got to do this. And I'm yelling at him, like, you've got to do this, Dad. And he goes to the announcer. He's like, um, hey, can my son do this instead of me? <laughs> this is that place of... <laughs> when you think you're standing firm, be careful not to fall. So the announcer goes, well, yeah, I, I, I guess so. Why not? So he's like, what's your son's name? Mike. Okay, Mike, you want to come up? Come up here. And so I come up and they're like, okay. My dad's like, okay, here, you do it. If you think you know it, so well, you do it. And so I was like, okay, I can do this. Let me say, the gift was on my dad. <laughs> the talent maybe I had, but not in the moment. <laughs> And so I go to do this, and I'm like, oh, you know, I've been yelling at him of how to do this, and there's people like lined on both sides, and the and the and the the uh, the cars at the other end with the window down. And here, you know, you're on the Megatron, right? Everybody's there's like 35,000 people watching you, and and I go to hit this thing, I throw the ball up, and I hit it, and I don't know if I wasn't looking or what, but. I missed the ball. <laughs> but I hit it kind of. And I hit it sideways. And so it was like, it's like if I was going this way, I hit it and the ball went phoom, like this. And it hit this little 12 year old girl hard. And I'm like, oh Lord. Like, if you've ever seen those uh, US or the Southwest ads, it's that want to get away. <laughs> I was that moment, man, I just wanted to curl up in a ball and just, like, hide. That was a place of the Lord will humble you <laughs> when you raise yourself up. So I want to encourage you, just because you think you have the talent, don't step into something to do it. Make sure it's the calling on your life. Make sure it's what God's calling you to do. And don't try to take somebody else's calling. <laughs> oh, Lord. All right. Can you guys stand? Ah. I pray that this, that we begin to get this understanding of what humility, why, why humility is so important. If we want to see the body of Christ become the body of Christ, we have to first humble ourselves. This is what's going to actually give us that strength that the Lord can build on, that he can build to a greater capacity than we can build on our own. And it all starts with humility. And then in that, that we would learn to not just operate in our own talents, but we would go beyond our own talents 
to begin to operate in the giftings that he's called us to do, that we would do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. And that his love is so extravagant that this is his desire for us. So would you just put your hands out? And as we close, I just I want to give an opportunity. I just Before we can even humble ourselves, the first place of humility is actually saying we need a Savior. We need a Lord. And it's that we have the cure to the virus. Jesus is the way. He is the truth, and he is the life, and there is no other way. It all starts with him, and when we, ex when we receive that extravagant love, then we begin this journey, then we begin this adventure that we get to go on with the Lord. So with every head bowed, I just want to say, if that's you, if, if you have never made Jesus Lord of your life, if you've, if you've never said, I need a Savior, if you've never humbled yourself in that way, that's the first place of receiving his grace. There's no other grace that you can receive before receiving that grace. For he opposes the proud, but he will give grace to those that say yes to his son, that say you, you're the only way. I bow before you, Jesus, as king, and I will live my life for you. So if that's you, I just I want to give you an opportunity. If, if Maybe this is the first time, or maybe this is the second or the third time and you're just saying man I need to just recommit my life to the Lord I need to say yes to him I need to say that he's not only my Lord but he's my Savior he's not only my Savior but he's also my Lord he's the one that I will obey the one that I will, will bow to that's the place of humility that we need to step into so if that's you I just would you would you raise your hand would you just say yes I see that hand over there yeah if there's others Man, don't miss the opportunity just to, to bow. I see that hand right there. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. If there's others, just this is an opportunity just to say yes. Yeah, I see another hand, another one. Mm, thank you, Lord. So you know, you know who you are. And I'm going to just stay with your heads bowed. We're going to say this prayer together, and it's not just the prayer but what it is, it's a place in your heart that you just say yes to the Lord. And, and when you say yes to him, and he says yes to you. It says when you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. When you bow before him, he will come to you. He will give you grace. Everything, your past, sins, things, they are washed away. What, what, is, what is it from? It's from the blood of Jesus. It's the most powerful thing in this world that we have it cleanses us from all impurities from all sin it brings us into that right standing with the father it's only by the blood of jesus and it starts with just acknowledging him as our lord and savior so let's just repeat this prayer lord jesus i acknowledge you as lord and savior of my life I humble myself before you. I repent from all sins. Would you forgive me of the sins of my life? And Lord, I look to you. You're the author. You're the perfecter of my faith. And I acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. And I come to you. And I thank you that you come to me and you draw me into your presence and you give me your love that I can now be seated at the right hand with the Father and with Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And let me just pray over you. Lord, I just thank you for each person here, for those watching online. Lord, I thank you that you're teaching us a new understanding of humility, a new understanding of, of walking in your grace and receiving these giftings and using these giftings for the unity of the body of Christ, that you would be glorified in all things, that Christ in us, it's that hope of glory 
Lord, may you be glorified. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us, that you would give us this understanding, that this would go deep into our hearts, that this mixture would, 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 would be mixed before it's solidified. And Lord, that they're in these testings, or test our hearts. See if there's any anxious thoughts in us, Lord. You, use this time just in this season, Lord, that as we're in this curing process, Lord, of, of coming into the next season, into the new things that you're calling us into, Lord, would you test our hearts? And Lord, I, there is never a point where we go, we've got humility. It's a constant testing of our hearts. And so that we would never lose that place of staying humble before you. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing with us as a body. I thank you how you're strengthening us. And I pray your blessing. I pray your peace over every person here. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.